Let me just kind of move some stuff around. Let me just go ahead and add this chat in here too. Great. So um, as we go through, um, if you have questions, uh, let me know. Uh, it's a small group. My plan is going to go through a lot about multi-level modeling, specific longitudinal. Why do you want to use this approach? And kind of talk through some of the specific things that you might be asked about when you run this type of analysis and what you should report. And also I'm going to show you some kind of tricks that I do within this too. Um, so I don't do a lot of uh, longitudinal multi-level modeling because I don't have really get to use that type of data a lot though. I mostly do a lot of structural equationing modeling. So there's gonna be differences of how different folks approach this. So this is coming from an educational psychology and psychology lens. So I just wanna kind of preface that that's uh, the discipline that I'm trained in. So that's kind of how I'm approaching this type of analysis as well. So let me go ahead and put this again into the chat. Uh, so these are the links again to the to the Google Drive. So this completed output that if you want to kind of walk through later on, there's that. Uh, there's data manipulation and simulation code. I went ahead and simulated a measure for that we can do multi-level reliability for a measure. And I'll walk you through that. But mostly you want to go into this code and data, and that's going to be the QMB. That's the R code we'll be using today that's heavily annotated. And then the dailyy.csv file. So that data we're going to be using today for this workshop. We'll also be pulling in some other some materials too within this. Um, I also the second link that's in the chat is this link to CenterStat. This is um, this is uh, Dan Bauer and Patrick Currens. Um, they have a kind of this think tank that they have, uh, just really fantastic. So last year, American Psychological Association hosted a over the course of two or three months. It was an intensive longitudinal data seminar series. And what they did was they actually have all the lectures recorded on YouTube and they have all the materials. So that's a link to the archive of this training session. It was fantastic. Highly, highly recommend it because these are some really big names in the field. Especially Jean Philippe is just phenomenal. Phenomenal. That's a specialization is multi-level modeling and it really intensive longitudinal designs. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I provide that resource as well to you. Um, so for multi-level modeling, the idea here is that we have data that's nested. And we're trying to account for this nestedness. If we don't account for it, then we run into an issue with independent observations because we don't have independent observations with nested data. Uh, so extending that idea for multi-level modeling framework is longitudinal multi-level modeling. So rather than talking about like uh, students nested within classrooms, that's really the typical hierarchical linear modeling we have a longitudinal. So it's the same individuals that are responding at multiple times a day or over many, many days. So that's what we're talking about for longitudinal multi-level modeling. So in this workshop, we, we're assuming some familiarity with the R. If you're new to R, that's that's great. Love to have you aboard. Um, there's other links to videos. I'm happy to send more information about um, R as well. If you're getting started with R, I have a whole Canvas page to get you up and running. If you're interested in that, send me an email, add you ASAP. Uh, so for this one, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover how to restructure data, how to assess the degree of nestedness, how to run a basic two-level multi-level model, and also do the interpretations. So these are kind of our goals for today, our learning outcomes. Um, this isn't gonna be meaning that you walk out of this as an expert in multi-level modeling. That's gonna take a lot of training, even I'm still learning and kind of adapting and training. But this will give you a really good foundation. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is really kind of going to the code and walk through the step-by-step -step process and the thinking from my perspective within this. So within launch, the launch to a multi-level modeling, we have multiple time points responses from the same individual over time. Um, this could be ecological momentary assessment data where we have multiple small assessments during each day over the course of a week or two, or longitudinal assessments. For today, we'll be doing what's called the daily diary, which is really, really popular in psychology. So the idea is every day someone's completing this survey. So we have, in this case, we have over the course of eight days, 190 participants took this data and took these responses to the same 190 individuals across each day. Now, from a structural point, we can think of it as we have our level one, which is going to be our time points. We want at least three time points for it to be a multi-level model. If you have less than that, when you try to put a, a, a line on that, it's going to be problematic because it's always going to be a perfect line. So really, you want at least three time points. Uh, the more, the better. 
Um, ideally, you need at least 10 individuals as your level two. So think of it as time points nest within individuals. You need at least 10. If you have less than that, you have convergence issues. Uh, you can do a Bayesian approach, which I love, but you have to have really strong priors and strong information about that. So really, the more individuals, the more data points you have, the better. Um, so first we're going to do is we're just going to load in all the data, or all the packages we'll be using. Um, I'm going to jump back and forth within the source and visual. I'm using visual for now because I'll be pulling up some equations and it just makes it easier to talk through the equations. Um, this isn't going to be an equation heavy thing, uh, but I want to make sure that just kind of for to help explain as we go through things what's going on here. Again, this is from a psychology slash educational psychology perspective. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to load all the packages as a list. And then I have it scan my computer and anything that's not installed, it goes ahead and installs it. And then we have some of the libraries that'll be active for today. Some of them would be activating as needed basis. Um, I'm also turning off uh, scientific notation because I absolutely despise it. It's too much mental math for me. So I like to turn it off by using the option SciPen. Uh, so for this data that we'll be using today, this is a public data set from Penn State's Quant Dev Lab, and the, this code has been adapted from their tutorial, and I've added a bunch of things to it. So uh, for those who aren't familiar with Quant Dev, they are just absolutely phenomenal. Let me go ahead and pull up their website. Um, so they have, this is where I got the tutorial from and some of the data from. It's fantastic. We'll be doing a slight variation of this, so it's not going to be the same thing. And also includes some additional variables and some different methodologies within it. The nice thing with Quant Dev is if you go on the tutorials page, they have a whole bunch of great tutorials, everything from a survival analysis, growth trajectory modeling, intensive longitudinal designs, ecological momentary assessment, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's really, really just a fantastic, so even IRM response here, which I love. So some really, really great stuff there. So highly, highly recommend it. So I want to make sure I give a shout out and credit for them. This is their data and I modified their code for this workshop. So within this, we'll be using experience sampling. So that's variables at the level one or the time point level, as well as we'll have predictors at the individual level. So at the individual level, these are only typically done at baseline. They don't change over time. So they're constant for each data point. Think of it as individual level data rather than daily level data. If you're interested more about the data set itself, there's some fantastic information on their site. Uh, here's a really brief blurb about it though. So it was experience sampling for daily diaries. Uh, so the idea within this is actually from uh, Greg Hancock and John Herring's uh, book. So for you, if you don't know them, two fantastic faculty members at UMD, they do some really, really fantastic stuff. Uh, so within this, the idea is we're looking at stress reactivity. That's in that's a person level dynamic characteristic, and the extent to which an individual's daily negative affectivity is related to how much stress they perceive during the day. So stress reactivity that's within personal association between daily negative affectivity and daily stress. So we're talking about negative affectivity viewing the world as a kind of negative. It's kind of looking at it that way. So there was 190 participants in the study, and they took the study every day for eight days. Uh, so we kind of talked about the example, the example description. Our outcome is negative affectivity. Higher scores mean more negative view. So that's kind of what we're looking at. We are independent variables. We have our perceived stress. We're going to reform this so it's going to be reverse coded because right now higher scores mean less perceived stress. I hate when that happens because it's counterintuitive. Higher scores should always be higher levels of a construct in my mind. We'll be also including a level two independent variable, which is the baseline neuroticism score based on the big five inventory. So this is our multi-level equation, y sub i y with i sub or i sub j. So the i is representing the daily scores from zero. Zero is the first day to seven. The j represents the individual level for notations. So we have our intercept, and we have our slope for x one our b, x2, and so forth with some error. In this equation, our outcome variable is going to be our negative affectivity. That's our y i sub j. We also have, is a function of the daily specific intercept. That's, and we also have an individual specific slope, in which will indicate the within class association of negative affectivity plus residual error, or e i sub t. Now we can rewrite the specific equation for an individual, the b sub i 
a B0 sub I, which are intercept for an individual as gamma 0, 0 plus gamma 0, 1, Z, I. So the gamma 0, 0, that's our fixed effect for the average individual's intercept. Gamma 0, 1 is individual differences in the individual specific level intercept related to person between person differences in the variable. That's a mouthful. The idea is we can break down the equations to account for nested data. That's the idea here that we're going with. So we can also do the same thing for individual specific slopes for our independent variables. And we can kind of break that down into our gammas as well. So we can take these deconstructed betas, put them back to an equation and look at a more complex equation that looks at the gamma specifics. Uh, that's as far as we're gonna go with equations. Actually, that's a lie. We'll go a little bit more with a couple of equations, but not gonna be anything like this though. Uh, but just to get a sense, it's just regression. That's all this is. It is just regression that's been broken down to account for repeated measures. So what we're gonna do first, we're gonna load in the data set. So I wanna make a note of this because I, what I did was I restructured the data set that was on QuantDev's website that was in long format, which is what you want to use for multi-level modeling to a wide format. This is counterintuitive because I just kind of broke things. But what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how to go from a wide data set so that is each row is an individual and convert that into a data format for multi-level modeling. I also simulated items A, B, C, and D for each of the eight days. That way we can actually calculate within between person internal reliability. So that's why we gave these individuals a four item scale every day. We would want to account, or we'd want to report then the within-person internal reliability and the between-person reliability as part of the study. We can't just toss internal reliability or come back alpha and call it a day. We have to do something a little bit more specialized given the repeated measures design. So first we're going to do is we're going to pull in that data set. So what we did was we went ahead and I downloaded the code and the CSV file put in the same location on my personal computer. So I have it in a little folder. Um, I don't like using setting working directories because it makes it hard for reproducibility. So if I send you this code with a set working directory, you're not going to have that file pass. So I don't ought to have it do that. So what I do first, we're just going to read in our data. So we take a quick look at it. We go ahead and also look at it this way. So this data is in wide format. So each individual based on our ID is a row. And we have our negative affectivity for day zero, day one, day two, day three, Day four, our perceived stress score for zero, day zero, day one, day two, day three, all the way to day eight. And we also have our four items, A, B, C, and D for day zero, day one, day two, and so forth. So that's the data structure. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to reformat this so that rather than each row is a single individual, each row is going to become a different day. So we're going to have a long data structure. Now, this is what gets the most tricky part. So what we're first going to do is we also have some, I forgot to mention this, we also have to pull in some other data too. So we have individual level data. So we need to pull in our neuroticism score. So we're just going to pull that directly from QuantDev's website. We're going to read that in, and we're just going to use the ID and the neuroticism score. So we only save those two variables so we can then merge things together. So what we're going to do now is we need to format this so each time point for each individual is on a separate line rather than each row is all the responses from an individual. This is what's called long format. If you're doing multi-level modeling, this is going to be the way you want to have it reshaped. This could be the most challenging, though. So what we're doing first is when we activate the reshape2 package, we're going to say what the daily wide is. That's our daily level data. And we're creating a day or time variable called day. We'll be using this for our analysis later on. We also have ID var. That's going to be our ID. We're saying its direction is long, and we're separating it by this underscore. Because all of our variables here that have multiple days, it's all separated by an underscore. And I'm saying everything that's time varying is from column 2 to column 49. That's all the variables here. So it knows what exactly we need to restructure. So we're going to put in our data into there. And it's going to go ahead and reformat for us. I'm just going to change the ordering to make it easier to read. So I'm going to have it sort by ID and then by each day. And I'm going to get rid of the row names because I don't like those. So now if we look at our data set, we go ahead and put it at the daily level. 
Now we have it in a wide, or sorry, a long format. We have each row is a specific day. So we have person one, 101, 101, 101 for, from day zero to day seven, followed by person 102 from day zero to day seven. And then we have, for our daily level, we have a daily score for negative affectivity, a daily score for perceived stress, and then our four item scale, each item there for each day. So this is the data that we'll be wanting to use for our type of analysis. So this is kind of the biggest thing you'll have to do with multi-level modeling, is gain the data set in a structure that's usable. I also want to create a summed variable. So actually, this is going to be more of an averaged one. Uh, just so it's on the same metric rather than a aggregated. So I'm going to go ahead and just add all these up, divide it by four. And if I look at our daily wide, oops, our higher daily long, actually, there's our measure score. Again, items A, B, C, D, those were randomly simulated, and the code's also in, in that Google Drive. So perceived stress, or perceived severity of stress, it's actually reverse coded. So higher scores actually mean less perceived stress. We want to reverse code that, so higher scores will actually mean higher perceived stress. That way it's more intuitive. So what we're going to do is we're going to take four minus our daily long stress, and then we're going to turn that into a new variable called stress. We're just flipping it. So now if we go back to our daily long, hey, here's our reverse coded. So that's exactly what we want. So what we can now do, though, is now we can take in our individual level data, which is our ID and our neuroticism from Brig5 inventory, and we can just merge that together. So we're going to merge that by ID here. So we're going to have our data set. And let me go ahead and bring this back up, because I want to mention something that's really important. So all this data right now, this is all at the daily level, except for our baseline score here. This is because this is a baseline score. It's a level two predictor or an individual level predictor. So it's not going to be changing at a daily level. So for each individual, they have the same score for for all eight days. So there's not going to be any variability within person, but there is going to be variability between persons, hence it being a level two predictor. So we can then check our data and get a good sense of what this is. So now that we restructured things, uh, something that you might be asked by a reviewer is, well, what's your between within person correlations? So Think of it as rather than just running correlations of our entire data set, we need to think about this in terms of a multi-level structure. So we're going to have correlations for our within person as well as between person. So what we can then do is we can actually look at the correlations across both of those levels to get a sense of how our variables are reacting with one another. So I really like this is within the site package. It is going to throw an error message because we've included BFIN, which is a level two predictor. So we're not going to have any within person variability there because it's a constant for each individual. So you are going to get these errors. That's okay. If we removed it, we wouldn't have that. But we can then look at our intraclass correlation percentage, variance due to groups within that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we have our correlations between groups. And we can report that correlation matrix. We can also report our within groups. And notice anything with uh, neuroticism, it's NA, that's because it's a constant for each individual. But we can then report our within group correlations within this. Uh, so I've, I've heard some researchers who are running longitudinal multi-level model, they've been asked by reviewers recently to provide that information. So this is a quick way to do that. Now, uh, by training, I love psychometrics. It's my area of focus for my own personal research. So I'm always curious about measurement error. And not curious, I guess, but more kind of scared of it. Because if you have a really garbage measure, how can you say you measure what you think you're measuring? So uh, what we can then do is we can actually calculate internal reliability at both the person or the within person reliability as well as between person reliability. So what we can then do is these are the equations. This is actually from uh, Schrute and Lane's uh, book. Uh, so there's a citation later on for this. Uh, they you used to have to do this by hand. Uh, the psych package included a function to be able to do this automatically, but this is the equation if you wanted to use it. So we're using the within and between within this. So we can then extract this. We are going to get some warnings. And um, this is because I simulated the, the measurement, the, the four item measure at 
the within rather than a true multi-level framework. So it's not going to be a perfect thing. I uh, just realized an equation issue here. This is actually be RC rather than RKFI. I'm going to update the code after this workshop and fix that. That way it's the correct equation or just that correct notation. So within should be RC. This takes a little bit of time for it to run. It's going to be the longest thing. Uh, and again, we're going to get this error message because I simulated it. It's not true data. So it's going to be not perfect. So if you want to look at within-person reliability, we can port this. And you can see really low within-person reliability. I'm not surprised because this is a function of how I simulated the data. I put all the uh, correlation between each of the items as 0.9. So, but when we restructure that, it kind of breaks things a little bit. We can also look at our KR, which is between person reliability. And we can see we actually have really, really high correlate or within person reliability, so much so that we probably collapse things and it has redundancy at the measure. Again, a function of how we simulated the data. If we wanted to break down the components for the actual equations up here, we can actually do the components of this and we can pull all those out and do it by hand. It'll give you the same information. Um, fantastic book. It's, um, yeah, it, I'm really glad they made the functions within R for this. One of the important things I want to mention is mean centering. Um, I know some folks, if they're doing multiple modeling, they don't mean center. I know some folks where they have, where they think they have to do it. It depends. There's a, I don't want to say it's a lot of uh, personal opinions on this, but it depends on your specific discipline, your frame of how you're doing this, and more importantly, your research questions. Uh, always a big fan of letting theory drive the bus within these things, as well as kind of thinking through what's your specific research question, have that be all aligned. So centering, it will change the interpretation of the results. So it really depends on your question. I'm a big fan of Pugh's uh, 2010 article. There's um, information about that at the bottom of this as reference, but it's a really, really good read and primer. So you can uh, you can actually mean center two different ways. There's cluster centering. So what you're doing then is think of it as um, when you're doing clustering or clustering level, you're centering at the individual level. So rather than a grand mean centering, which is based on the entire sample, we're centering at the individual level, and that's deviations from their average scores across days. Uh, so if your research question is focusing on the relationship of the independent variables on the dependent at your level one, or if the, if the level one independent variable has interactions with another predictor, you want to use clustered or mean group centering within this, or group mean centering. Um, this is going to be a better approach to give you unbiased estimates. Grand mean centering is used if you're more focusing at the independent variable at a level two level or at the individual level rather than at the daily level. So again, it really, really depends. This is going to be more similar to an ANCOVA. I have strong thoughts about ANCOVA. All of them are negative. I do not like ANCOVA for a variety of reasons, um, but I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole with that. Um, so I'm not a big fan of ANCOVAs, uh, but it's all going to depend on your research questions. Uh, for this one, we're going to do, uh, we're going to person center or cluster sample our measures because we also have an interaction we want to model. And we're going to be using deviations from their averages within this. Honestly, if you're doing daily diary, the within person centering, that's going to be the most common thing you're going to run into. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to create a, a person mean centering or a cluster centering of the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our data set. We're going to pipe that in and we're going to sort essentially, we're going to group it by IDs. So that way we're taking that nested structure. We're going to create using the mean of stress a cluster mean. That's our average score for individual. Just all the eight days, what's our average? From there, we can then take uh, the daily level. We're taking our mean st or a stress variable and subtracting that cluster mean. That's going to be the deviations away from the mean for each individual. And then we can also do the same thing with, with our measure score because we're going to create an interaction term. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And if you wanted to grand mean center uh, neuroticism, this is a quick way to do it. So we just use the scale function. I really like this. It's quick. Just make sure you have scale equals false. We're also going to turn this into a array later on because it doesn't play nice sometimes. But if we check this really quick, we can just verify. Let me go and switch this to source code now. Let me get rid of the outline. 
So I am always with the mindset, trust, but verify. So I would want to make sure that within this, we have our original neurosystem system score. If we meet grand mean center, well, it should be zero. This is a way just to verify, okay, did we center correctly? Because if not, I've had it where I try to run stuff and if I don't do it right, well, there's an issue here. Now, looking at this, the grand mean center for neuroticism, that looks great. Mean is zero, perfect. Um, what we can do at the individual level, though, is I like using the psych package. We're going to group by our ID and look at stress, which is cl within cluster center. And we're storing that as an object, and we're just checking, making sure our means, they should be close to zero. Um, let's see what's going on here. Oh, I think I know what happened. Let me just do that. Hmm, something weird's happening here. Um, I'll have to update this code really quick uh, and figure out what's going on here because it should be it should be zeros. So um, that's most unfortunate. Um, I will correct this uh, and we upload that to the Google Drive in the next couple of days. Um, something in my code is not working right, which is really annoying because this was working yesterday. Um, so skipping past that, um, this is why it's always good to test stuff multiple times beforehand. It was fine before, but fix it later. So what we can then do is we're going to go ahead and look at this uh, by outcome. So with the MISTI package, we can get descriptors or a multi-level. So we can get the number of cases, number of missing values, number of clusters. That's just our individual numbers, a minimum and maximum cluster size. And we also get our ICC here too. So we mostly be focusing on ICC1 and design effect. Um, design effect is really important measure because it, it provides a metric to determine how nested your data is. Uh, we're going to come back to that in really quick and talk a little bit more through that. Um, if you want to look at within person associations for a subset of individuals, we can do a faceted plot. So what we're doing is we're just looking at IDs for a certain subset, like any IDs less than or equal to 125. We're just taking a quick look at our outcome of negative affectivity by stress and just taking a really quick look at it. This is breaking the multi-level mug because we're looking at individual level. We're not looking at the overall sample. So ICCs, this is going to be a must to report if you're running any sort of multi-level model. So think of it as it's the degree of nestedness. So do you really need to use multi-level modeling? Um, there's some folks who say you have to have a large ICC to run multi-level modeling. There's no good metric for a large ICC, though, and I'm using air quotes with that. Um, it's not a standardized metric, uh, so that you'd probably want to use something called a design effect instead, which has good determinations of, well, what level, what, at what point do you need to use multi-level modeling? That being said, there's different camps. There's some camps who say you have to have a good ICC, otherwise you're essentially wasting your time because you just run this as an OLS. It's not going to impact things too much. That's one camp, and I want to acknowledge that camp. I'm in the other camp. I'm in the, if you have nested data, you need to account for nested data. doesn't matter the level of ICC. Given your data structure, you need to account for it. Again, that's just my training. Uh, so that's how I was taught, and that's what I do. So it's still really important to account for this. So what we need to start with, we need to start with what's called a null model. This is what's called the intercept only. So we have no predictors in the model. This allows us to extract the information then to look at the variances within the model. So we're just looking at can negative affectivity be predicted by the intercept in a random error term for the intercept by using that grouping variable of ID. Now, a daily diary level, this type of longitudinal data, most more often than not, you're going to see an autoregressive correlation to account for that structure of the data. It's sometimes called an AR1 correlation. So if I was using just regular multi-level modeling, I'd use the LME4 package, call it a day, good to go. Unfortunately, um, the LME4 package, which is used widely in psychology for multi-level data, it can't handle an AR1 correlation matrix within this. So we have to use a different package. So we use what's called um, NLME. It's nonlinear or linear, nonlinear, multi-level modeling code within this. So it's going to be really similar, 
But the downside is it can't handle logistic regression. So if you want to know that, let me know. I have some working code. Happy to send stuff over. Um, but we're going to include an AR1 given the data structure. So when we do this, we have our function on, or at the LME. We have our outcome and predicted by one. This is going to be just an intercept only. On the next line, we have random. So we're going to say what our grouping of variables. We don't have a random slope. So we're just going to have a random intercept model. And we're grouping by ID because we have time points nested within ID or within person. We let them know what data set. And they say the correlation we're using an AR1. And if we have missing data, we're just excluding. So if we run that, this is going to be our null model. So we can take a look at it. We can take out the residual. We have our parameter estimates, number of observations, all that fun stuff, ASC, BSC, like log likelihood, and our value, standard error, and so forth for our intercept. Now then what we can do then is we can calculate the ICC. So what we do is we take the proportion of variance of the outcome that occurs between groups versus the total variance present. So it ranges from zero to one. So zero meaning no variance accounted for among clusters to one variance among clusters, but no variance within cluster. So the IC is taking the proportion and we're just calculating that. So we have the cluster's variance divided by the cluster plus variation within. So it's almost total. Easiest thing within this is just to use what's called the performance package. They have a built-in function, so we're not having to extract everything within this. So if we do this, we get our ICC, which is 0.328, so roughly 0.33. On a scale of 1 to 0, that's okay. But again, I'm in the camp that says if you have multi-level data, if you have nested data, run multi-level modeling. If we scroll up to where we had our multi-level data here, you see it's a little bit different here. We have design effect. Again, so depending on some rounding within this. Um, the one that we ran before from the MISTI package, that's not including an AR1, so that's going to change things slightly. Now, again, coming from an edge-like perspective, I really like what's called design effect. So what this is, it's um, it's based on a lot of simulation work by Muthen and others. So the idea is it empirically assesses if multi-level modeling is warranted. So what we do is we take 1 plus the average cluster number, minus 1, times the ICC. So within this, our average number of responses within cluster, that's going to be 8, because it's 8 days. And then, so that's going to be 7 times our ICC plus 1. When we calculate that, we're going to get our design effect. If it's greater than 2, we should use multi-level modeling. Here, we have a design effect of 3.6. So because that's greater than 2, we really should be using multi-level modeling. Again, kind of a no-brainer in my mind, but it's always good to report these in case you have a reviewer. Um, now, this part is kind of more optional. You don't have to take this approach. I really like it personally, but you don't necessarily need to do it. This is what's called a model building approach. Yeah, I really like Hawk's 2010s book. The idea is that we're incrementally building a more complex model and looking at how well that model performs at each level. This is really good if you have an exploratory model. If you have a really complex model that's based on theory, you don't necessarily have to do this approach. Um, I'm doing it just as an example. So what we're going to do is we're going to start, we already did our intercept only, that's our null model. We're going to have a model one for just our time, our measurement occurrence, starting at zero. We're going to include a level one predictor in model two. Model 3 is level 2 predictor. We're going to add our measure variable, a cross-level interaction, and then a random slope. We're going to all do those really quickly. And then at, um, later on, I'm going to show you how you do the interpretations of this, as well as how to make a really nice table for it. Now, in Model 1, even though we ran a null model, we're not going to call this our baseline model. That's because it's not accounting for time. So we really need to do that first. So when we talk about measurement occurrence, Typically, we count it as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now, in our data, I have it coded as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 6, 7. And this is because we want to make sure our intercept can be interpreted as the expected outcome on the first equation. So if we want to use RT, the, the model is going to be equivalent, but it's going to be more difficult to interpret if you start with 1. Because uh, the value zero is not within your range of scores of your measurement occurrences. So 
by making it go to from zero to seven rather than one to eight, your interpretation is going to be much easier because it will actually account for the true measurement occurrences. Um, if you're doing things like calendar age, setting the first observation to zero is not going to be the best solution, though. So you need to then center maybe on the mean or median of age. So depending on, again, what your research question is, you want to make sure your interpretations make sense. Otherwise, it's going to be really, really challenging. So if we do our baseline model, we're going to keep it the same framework. We're going to have our outcome intercept, and we're just adding plus day. And if we look at our daily, our day starts at zero. So we're just doing an AR1 as well, counting for that nested structure. If we go ahead and run this, now we're just going to have the predictor is just a day, but that's just accounting for day. We don't necessarily have to interpret that. Our p-value is statistically significant, it's zero. Technically, it's less than 0 0.001. It just kind of rounds some things within NLME. Because then we can go ahead and see what we have here, too. Now, what I want to do then is we're going to add in our person-centered stress. So we're going to add just stress. We perceive stress for each day. And we're just adding and we're building more each level a more complex model. What we could also then do is we could then, if we wanted to, we can extract our ICs or AICs and look at which one has the lowest AIC as a, a measure of misfit. So we have a 3021 here. If I go back here, uh, 3741, AIC is much better for our next model. So you could use that. You could also look at the log likelihood and do comparisons. We're not going to really do too much of that. Um, but that's how you can then look at which one has a better model for counting stuff. Now here we're going to add in our level two predictor of neuroticism, which is grand mean centering. So we're just adding that as an additional predictor and nothing else is changing. So we're just we're building on complexity by just adding additional predictors. We can then account for things. We can double check it. I like to just double check the correlations for the fixed effects. And then we can also look at our values. These are just our fixed effects coefficients, our standard errors for each one. Notice our DFs are different here. That's because our, neuro our neuroticism measure, that one is a constant for each individual. So that's going to have a different degree of freedom given that. Um, something that's different with an NLME versus LME4 that I want to mention just in passing is an LME provides p-values. The other package does not based on theoretical reasons because p-values for multi-level model get a little bit tricky because uh, it's not really a true value. It's more like an approximation. Um, I just want to mention that in passing because it's it can get a little bit heated in some circles. Now what we can do is we're going to go ahead and add our measure score, my simulated measure, which is actually a piece of garbage because it's all simulated and has no meaning into the data. Um, here we can see, oh, look at non-significant to our model. Can account for, cannot account for anything with negative affectivity. That's not really surprised because I didn't, I didn't create it with a correlation of that in mind. But then we can also do is we can then add a cross-level interaction. So this is why we took a grand mean centering in our cluster mean centering for stress in, in negative affectivity, or sorry, stress in neuroticism, because that way for looking at interactions, it makes it easy for interpretations. So to do a cross-level interaction, so it'd be the deviations from stress moderated by someone's neuroticism score, we would just add a colon here. That's going to go ahead and do an interaction term. So then when we look at it, we can then say, okay, within this, was there an interaction term of stress with neuroticism? And here we saw that, yes, there was. We can then extract our fixed effects. So this is, again, going to be our average fixed effects within the model. So no random slopes or intercepts within this for it. We can then actually create our visualization. So now we want to probe that interaction. First thing we want to do, this is more of a manual way to do this, is we extract our standard deviation for neuroticism, 0.95. We do the same thing for stress, which is 0.68. And then we put this in with the effect. So we're going to go ahead and use the effects library. We then take our interaction term within the model. And we do plus or minus both of those. So now we're looking at once the deviation above and below the mean within this. 
if we want to look at that, that's our standard deviation plus or minus. And we turn we convert this to a data frame and we plug that into ggplot2 within the data set to then actually look at where's the interaction here too. So we can actually take a good look at this. Um, why did it do? You see, um, so because stress, there was that issue with the group mean centering, it's going to throw this out of alignment right now. Uh, so because of that misalignment, I need to go back and fix this code because it should be just two lines rather than all of these. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here. Let me look at that in the next couple of days and fix that. And then it's, it'll be the same Google Drive. Um, another option is just using SJplot. And this will allow us to then extract the predicted values. These are the coefficients for your fixed effects. It's a really quick visual to see, okay, what's significant and what's the relationship to the outcome variable. We can then just extract our, our predicted values here. We'll use the same plus or minus standard deviation for negative affect for neuroticism, I mean. And then there we go, that's better. So what we do is we use SGPlot, and then I just go ahead and I change the group column and group name. It's always plus or minus the standard deviation. This way we can actually see, okay, what's that interaction? So we have monostress person-centered and neuroticism plus or minus a standard deviation. This will help us for interpretations for this. If we wanted to add a random slope, so that means that each individual, they're going to have a different slope for the measure variable. That way we have the random tilde. Right before the vertical bar ID, our grouping variable, we would put our random slope here. So you can really, it's really quick to do this. We would run that. And then we'd go ahead and extract that with including a random slope. You'd want to use that based on theory. Um, so for interpretations, I used uh, the quantitative methodology page as an example, given that this was their data. So we're going to focus on just the fixed effects because that's more typically what's reported. So let me go ahead and scroll up this up a little bit. So if we looked at our fixed effects, so we look at all the fixed effects values, so for intercept, this is the expected value of negative affectivity for an, a prototypical person on a prototypical day, and that is 2.9. That's our century. No, nothing else about anyone else in this. What's our best guess for negative affectivity? For negative affectivity, there's a decrease over the course of the study days for each unit. So for each increase in a day, there was a negative affectivity decrease by 0 0.06, which was statistically significant. Looking at neuroticism, individuals with higher neuroticism scores tended to experience slightly higher negative affectivity, about 0.17, which is also statistically significantly different from zero. For our stress, CWC, this is one that I need to go back and fix a little bit. So the numbers are slightly, slightly off here. Actually, no, they're pretty close. With rounding, okay. Um, so within this, on days where prototypical individuals perceive stress was higher than usual, so that's they have a higher deviation than their mean, their negative affect also tended to be higher than usual. But it's 0.84 was the coefficient, which is statistically significantly different from zero. For measure, that's the simulated one. Here we see that was non-significant, negative 0 0.03 with rounding. So on days when a prototypical individual's measure scores were higher than, let's see, this one was higher than usual, I should say, the negative affective tended to be slightly lower, but that was not statistically significant from zero. For interaction, differences within person association between stress and negative affectivity were moderated by neuroticism stress level. Um, so we then want to take interpret that, then we'd also want to look at the figure and interpret that figure more directly. And we can also look at the, the confidence intervals for both random and fixed effects. So we kind of just plug that into intervals, and we get the upper and lower bounds for estimates, as well as the random effects one as well. Uh, for effect sizes. So there's different ways to do this for multi-level modeling. Uh, the first one's going to be analogs for R squared, similar to regression. 
The second is proportional reduction in variance. So this is um, a different way of, it's a more common way to do it. It's not as easy to interpret as R squared. Uh, so R squared is less common in multi-level modeling. If you wanted to do the R squared, here's the equation. I'm not going to turn it back over to visual, but there's the equation if you wanted to calculate it, it by hand. So we can go ahead and extract things. Um, if we want to do that, we would just turn this the variance covariance matrix here. That's our model one. We use model five here. We would take our model one, which is our baseline, because you want to use the baseline rather than the null for longitudinal. And then we can kind of plug that in to get our level one R squared. So our R squared based on level one predictors. And what was our R squared for our level two? We can't really just add them together, though. That's not how this is going to work. So there's other recommendations here, too. So there's a great package. This was by Wrights and Strubba. So they have an R package that can calculate different variations of the R squared. So they also have a Loudenbush in VERC1. Um, so different variations again. So it's also more common to actually use the to proportion reduction. So we can calculate that for each of our different predictors as well as our intercepts. So we just kind of plug this into a random effects that we extracted to before and calculate that. So just proportion reduction and variance by including that within the model. Uh, for level two, we can also do the variance components here, proportion reduction in the intercept, and then go ahead and do that same thing. Um, if you wanted to get the R squared that's automated, this is the Sturber and Wrights one. So it's a quick decomposition. If we chose our model one, we can plot that in there and we can look at So this is just a model one that's just our time variable included in our model. We'd be able to look at what's the fixed slopes, intercept variation, and what's left over, what's the residual from that. If we did our model five, we can get our within cluster R squared, our between cluster R squared, and reduction in mean square prediction, which is more common. So we can also then account for these. So different ways of accounting for R squared as measure of effect within this. Um, it's again, I want to mention that proportion reduction, it doesn't behave like R squared because it's because you're comparing one model to another rather than the amount of variance explained by the dependent variable. So really different interpretations. Um, if you really, if you like me, like standard has beta weights, we can just plug in our model, look at the partial, and then we get our standardized estimates. Here, intercept drops out of the model within this, but then those, those are our standardized scores. We can also look at our unstandardized coefficients, which is just our basic information here too. Now, because I did a modeling approach, this is a quick way for table creation rather than having to do this painstakingly with an Excel. Please never do that. You're more likely to make an error within this. So this is a quick way I like to do it. I start with a model list, and then I add intercept model baseline, and I just plug in all the models I ran. So essentially, I have a list of models. I can then plug this into a package called model summary. I put the list in there, and I just have my stars for statistical significance test within for HTML. It's going to give you this nightmarish HTML code. So if we rendered this, this would actually make sense. But what you can then do is you can have it be output as a docs file. And then we'll let that run for a second. And wait for this to update. There we go, it's updated. So now if I open up this in a Word doc, this is what we had our plug out to. We have our intercept only model. There's our intercept, we have day. So that's all of our models here in a table. We can then remove stuff. It has some additional information like ASC, BIC, the ICCs, which is a constant. So I'd probably want to remove this because like, eh, you know what? I really don't care about that in the table. But that's a really quick way to make a, a table that has all the different models in there. They can then guide readers to. So I'm really a big fan of kind of working smarter, not harder with this. Um, below here, so with multi-level modeling, there's a chance where you might have uh, just issues where it just doesn't want to converge. Sometimes it will converge and it's it's fine. Sometimes it won't converge and it's like, okay, well, is this, can I trust the results? Can I not? Because sometimes it won't converge, but you can still use the responses or the information, sometimes you can't. So this is kind of my, it's been commented out here. 
So you'd have to get rid of these and add an extra little, um, make it an R chunk here. But these are codes that I use to then assess for conversions. And is it like, is it okay based on the different codes? Or if it's not, what are some different ways to then try to almost like kickstart the model? If there's a singularity, so different optimizers that can be used. So it's essentially just sandbox code that you can try different things with. Um, when all else fails, I throw Bayes at it. And I do a Bayesian multi-level modeling. It's more flexible. It can account for violations better. It, it's really great. And it's just, there's also a lot of additional steps and you have to really think about the distributions uh, and your degree of the certainty and uncertainty within the model. So when you report multi-level modeling, this is a great excerpt or checklist from the coach uh, 2010. So this was in uh, Greg Hancock's uh, quantitative, uh, the reviewer's guide for quantitative methods uh, version two. This is a checklist from there. It kind of walks through all the major things you want to discuss. And then some really great citations. Uh, the Hawks book I really like, uh, Gelman and Hill's phenomenal, and a bunch of other ones if you're really interested. There's also, wherever I got code, I want to make sure there was resources and kind of pointing you to the specific resources. Um, our psychologist for Model, that's a really fantastic one. Uh, Ren Vandershoot's another really great one. Um, if you're using different covariance structures, we really didn't talk about this. We assumed an AR1. But let's say it's a different type of matrix or covariance structure. These are some different ways you can go about doing that and learning how to incorporate those within the model. Uh, some code like LME4 versus NLME have different options. So depending on what you want to do, there's some documentation on this. Um, Autocorrelations really some detailed information on that. But if you're new to multi-level modeling, um, highly, highly recommend the Gelman book. That's a really good starter. I also really like this Lima course. It's completely free. It's from the Center of Multilevel Modeling at University of Bristol. Um, I did it. It's phenomenal. It walks you through the basics of multilevel modeling to more advanced stuff. It was from a grant-funded thing they did that's just to train folks how to use multilevel. So it's always going to be free. And you can do a certificate at the end. Uh, so it's a really good one. It has like different programs to do, too. So it's we covered a lot in a little amount of time. Um, let me go ahead and... Put in the the link really quick for the evaluation. Uh, it helps us with programming. Uh, so thinking about uh, future semesters, if you're interested. I'm always interested in the kind of this more, is there certain quantitative topics you're really interested in that helps me plan accordingly and make sure it's just not something I'm purely interested in. I, I like multi-level modeling, so I want to talk about it. Um, but happy to um, go ahead and answer any questions you, you have, might have, talk through things. Um, again, this is really meant to be a primer, but always, always happy to talk more. Uh, so let me go ahead and I'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, yeah, just let me know. Let me know if you have any questions. And um, again, I'm going to make some updates to the code, make that correction that one that kind of threw everything for a loop. Um, not sure what happened there, but I'm going to update that onto the the one or the Google Drive in the next couple of days. Let me go ahead and also put in my email address. So always happy to chat more. I love talking about this stuff. So um, if you have questions, always kind of happy to do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Just kind of talk through your research project. If you do multi-level modeling, awesome. If you're not, that's awesome too. Um, and just thank you all so much for for attending this workshop. I hope it was helpful. And again, feel free to let me know if there's uh, things you want to learn or if things that'd be of help. Or again, let me know if you have questions. Again, I threw a lot at you, so it's um, we're gonna be. This is gonna be recorded, and happy to send the link out too.